As we begin today, I want to invite the ushers to come in and hand you all a little uh, token that we're going to be using uh, for at the end of the sermon, and these little wooden hearts. So uh, can you uh, make sure the ushers haven't left? There they are, yeah. Uh, you will find uh, the uh, plates that have the little hearts. Tom's getting them now. And then they were going to pass those out to you. Tell you what, those little things, those little hearts are hard to find. I had made an order through Michael's, and they were supposed to be in, and I got that disheartening email that said, oh, we don't have it in stock, even though the website said they did. And then I called Hobby Lobby. And I said, do you have these little heart-shaped thingies? Surprisingly, they had no idea what I was talking about. So I went in, and, and they did have them. And so uh, that's what we have this morning. Also, if you happen to have your uh, commit cards, I invite you to take a moment and look at them as we begin. And for those of you who do not have a commit card, our ushers will be more than happy to give you one. Just ask them for one. Now, this week we continue our sermon series on commit, and this series will run throughout the month, and it will culminate on Commitment Sunday, Reformation Sunday, October 31st. Now, next week, Ted Goines will be our guest preacher, and he will be talking about Lutheran Services Carolina, and the focus will be on neighbor. We here at St. Paul see commit in three ways. Commit to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Commit to a personal relationship with our neighbor. Commit to a personal relationship with St. Paul's, or if you are visiting your church home. If you happen to be looking for a church, we hope you will join us here. Last Sunday, Pastor Mark spoke about how God is committed to being in relationship with us. Simply put, God loves you. This week, I want to talk about our commitment to Jesus. Let me begin by sharing with you the thoughts of, of a comedian, Jeff Stilson, who was talking about how vulnerable we are when we fall in love, especially when you tell your mate for the very first time. And he says, you don't know how they will respond. You say, I love you, and they might answer, well, I think you're pretty special too. Not exactly the response one is looking for. I want us to think how much those three words, I love you, have on our lives. When someone says, I love you, that takes the relationship they have with you up another level and a deeper level. It means there is a deeper sense of commitment and obligation. So how do we respond when God says, I love you? Our answer today comes in the form of Abraham and Sarah, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and God. Genesis 12 is the beginning. It's the origin of the story of Abraham and Sarah and how Abraham became the father of many nations. Now, do you recall, remember what happens in chapter 11 of Genesis? It's the Tower of Babel. The people thought they could be as powerful as God. They thought that they could actually make a tower that reached God, reaching the same heights as God. But God disperses the people to various regions. He splits them up, and he causes the creation of various languages. So people could not communicate with one another as easily as they had before the tower. Now, why does God do this? Because God is upset at the people. God has shown nothing but love and grace, and yet the people want more. And when they want more, they tend to forget what they have and what has been given to them. Keep this in mind as I preach. While the people sin, God's love remains. And that is where Abraham comes in, or 
Abram, as he is called in our passage today. God sends Abraham and Sarah away from their family and friends, from the life that they knew, and towards a new life to start a new family and a new legacy. In our passage, God does not say the words, I love you, Abraham, but God shows his love by giving Abraham this important mission. It is quite amazing that after all the people have done to God throughout Genesis, that God still wants what's best for God's people. Think back to when Adam and Eve sinned. I'll, I'll hurry it up, I promise. <laughs> Think back to when Adam and Eve sinned and God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. God could have stopped right there. God could have started over, but God didn't. God still loved and cared for Adam and Eve and blessed them with a life outside of the garden. Then in chapter 6, God could have stopped when God sees how bad the people are behaving, but God didn't. God so loved and cared for the world that Noah and his family and the animals were saved so that the world would have yet another chance. And then, just in chapter 11, God could have stopped, but God didn't. God continued to say, I love you. So how does Abraham respond? Well, as you may have noticed, Abraham does not speak a single word in our passage, but he responds to God with action. Abraham did what God told him to do. Abraham did not say, I love you, God, but Abraham did show it. This shows amazing love and trust on Abraham's part. Abraham chooses to leave his old life behind and start something totally new at the young, tender age of 75. Paul explains this so well in our passage from Romans, where he writes that Abraham, hoping against hope, believed that he would become the father of many nations. Abraham's faith in God and God's mission was Abraham's I love you response to God. Now, remember when I said that saying I love you means the relationship goes to another level, that there is a deeper sense of commitment and obligation. What Abraham shows in his actions and faith is that he is all in on the relationship with God. So when God says I love you to us, it is not just an admission of love. It is also an invitation to relationship. When we look at the story of Jesus calling the first four disciples, remember, Jesus is not hiring them. He is not giving them jobs. He is giving them a call, a purpose. And he is inviting them into a relationship. And just like Abraham, the four disciples don't say a single word in the gospel reading for today, but they answer with their actions. They drop their nets, they get out of their boats, they step away from their old lives and even their family, and they step into a relationship with Jesus. Remember, throughout the story of Jesus and the disciples, these men go from disciples, students, to friends, to brothers, from students to family, Jesus' family. This morning, Jesus is offering us the same invitation, an invitation not into a mission, but a relationship, one based on love, one based on faith, and one based on action. Now, let me be very honest with you. I can't help but shake this feeling that when Jesus says, I love you, we are responding with, I think you're pretty special too, Jesus. Here's why I think that. And this is not a St. Paul's issue. This is a Christian church as a whole issue. We have made church more about our wants and needs and less about Jesus' love and grace. We have made church more about the music we play, the songs we sing, the style we worship, and less about the Bible, the word, and the sacraments. We have made church more about throwing people out and shutting the doors and less time about how we can tear off the doors and let everyone in. We come to Jesus when we need something. We do. We come, we take, 
and then go. From the very beginning, we come to Jesus when we need baptisms, school projects, confirmations, weddings, funerals, or to make mom and dad happy by showing up on Christmas and or Easter. And once we get what we need, we leave over and over again. To me, our actions do not say that we love Jesus, but we find Jesus special and we find Jesus useful. But Jesus offers so much more than that. Jesus continues to invite us into a relationship with him. When we do come for what we need and what we want, Jesus continues to open his arms to us and walks toward us and not away from us. If there is one thing we can all be grateful for is that God never learned his lesson back in Genesis. Despite all the times that we have, we can't, and we will disappoint God, God still loves us. And the words that we hear in every rite at church, the words that Jesus says in every baptism, every communion, every song, every sermon, every passing of peace, and every prayer still says, I love you. There was never a moment in all space and time where God never loved us. There was never a moment that God started to love us. That is not Jesus calling us special. That is Jesus calling us his children. My friends, we are loved so much and so deeply by Jesus. Jesus has given us his word on that. Jesus has given us his heart on that. And Jesus has given us his life on that. This morning, Jesus invites you to stop treating him special and start treating him as your beloved Savior, one who has his arms open for you to say and show him, I love you too, Jesus. I've committed my life to you as you have committed yours to me. And Jesus invites all of us into a relationship. And today, I invite to make your answer known. You were given a heart at the beginning of the sermon. Here, you see a cross at the font. Connie and I, we're going to play a special song for you. And during the song, I invite you to take that heart and walk to the cross and place your heart at the cross. And there happen to be markers. Bill, are there still markers right there? Okay. There are markers there where you can write your name or your initials and then put them in this offering plate. Or you can also take this heart and put it in your house, put it in your car, your pocket, wherever you can see it, and remind yourself that you are ready to say yes to Jesus and to take your relationship to the next level, today and always. So please, come to Jesus. <laughs>